Hey guys, Mike V from Reliable Automotive Equipment. Today we're working on a new video on the carbon unit A52001-A. You might know that we have one on the carbon unit already. This is the second generation unit. Uh, we're going to go through the setup of it and I believe this one actually has a little bit more power than the other one. They did some changes on it and we'll go through the whole thing in a minute. All right guys, in your kit that you have here on top, this little tray will come out. You should have your chart in here for all your settings. And there's also a owner's manual in here that does really have some pretty good pictures in it for assembling and disassembling the gun. All right guys, we're gonna start off on the carbon, the, the sheet that comes with it. There's some groupings on here that the first one up here is showing steel studs and it's showing different diameter of the studs of steel on steel. The next one is aluminum bits. So the aluminum bits are going to be used for actually doing dent repair on aluminum. The studs are actually going to become a replacement stud for the vehicle themselves. So as we go down the list here, we're going to get into aluminum studs, four, five, six, and eight millimeter diameter aluminum on aluminum. The next section is tension studs, which are actually going to be the rivet extraction studs that Audi and Porsche are now using. So if you look down here, it's showing a four, five, and a six millimeter stud, stainless steel stud on top of a stainless steel rivet. So these are going to be for extractions of the SPRs. And the last group down on the bottom is going to be for ground studs, the eight and the 10 millimeter aluminum ground studs on aluminum uh, products. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get ready to set up for a four millimeter aluminum stud and get our setting set. All right, so for setting up for a four millimeter stud, if we look at the chart, we are going to be going across here and it is going to be telling us a four millimeter aluminum stud on aluminum working material. Our first setting is going to be amperage of 400 amps. So on the system, A is for amperage, which is going to display up in here. So if we turn this knob, we're going to roll up to 400. Now one thing about this knob, if you turn this knob fast, it's going to jump up pretty high. So when you get, start getting closer to your number, you want to kind of slow down your travel a little bit so it doesn't jump as much. So we're going to dial this in at 400. And now we're going to move on over our timer for the welder is in milliseconds, which is marked over here as MS. So milliseconds is one thousandths of a second. On this one that we're gonna be working, it's calling for five milliseconds of timer. So up here it also says MS, and we're just gonna back this down to five. As we continue over on the chart, it's gonna call for gas time of one millimeter, one millimeter, I'm sorry, one second of gas time. And the way that we set up gas time is we're gonna go into the menu and if you see both knobs pointing to the menu, we're just gonna push these and we're gonna see gas is highlighted. And if I just turn this knob, it will move me over to different menus in here. The only one we're really gonna mess with at this point is our gas. So when that's highlighted like that, if I push this button again, it's gonna put me into the gas menu. So if I scroll over one to highlight the tank, right now it says off. I'm going to push this button to get me into the, be able to change that to on. Once I see on, push, and I can go over to my down arrow where it actually does say one second, which is what we want. But if I want to change that, I can highlight that and then change the number. I can go up with it or down. And on this, we're going to call for one full second. Going to hit the button again, so I'm out of that. The other arrow pointing up is actually gas post flow, which is going to be some gas that is going to keep flowing after you weld on the stud. So we're fine with a half a second on that. I'm going to turn this back till we go to exit. And then I'm going to hit that. That gets us out of that menu, but now it also shows that the gas tank is highlighted and so that we know that the gas is turned on. So that is our time for the gas for one full second. We are going to go across the chart here and it is going to tell us that our gas flow is going to be 10 liters per minute. 
So we're gonna set that on the gauge on the tank. So when we go to set our gas flow, here we run into a, just a tiny little issue. On the chart, it's calling for 10 liters per minute. Our gas gauge is a US gauge, which is listed as cubic feet per hour. So very simply, I went on Google, did a, a, a translation search from liters per minute to cubic feet per hour. 10 liters per minute equals 21 cubic feet per hour for our gauge that we're using. The nice part about this, any gas that we're using on this is gonna be the same setting of the flow. So once we set that at 21, that's gonna be the same for whatever operation that we do on that. To actually set the gauge, tank on, and just pull the trigger on the gun, make sure that the blue line is connected at the gun. So when I pull the trigger, we can actually have gas flow going, so I can adjust this, where I'm gonna bring it in right at 21 and that's just gonna remain consistent from then out. That's our gas setting that's gonna stay that way. All right, I wanna check my gas, pull the trigger, where again, we're right at 21. Gonna show you guys a little bit of a trick right now to make this a little bit more simpler. Take a little piece of masking tape, and what I'm gonna do is set this, right the top of the masking tape right about 21, and if I wrap this around the gauge, now, no matter where I stand, when I pull the trigger, I can see my lid right there, I'm good. Because 21 is going to be the same setting for everything that you do on this. Having the masking tape up there just makes it very simple. Standing away, hit the trigger, you know you have your gas on. Very simple. All right, so now we're going to set a stud in the stud holder. We're going to work with a 4 millimeter stud. We do have four millimeter, five millimeter, six millimeter, eight millimeter, 10 millimeter openings. And if they fit in the area that you have the right piece, if not, grab another one. So we're gonna grab the four millimeter one, gonna take one of my studs, and we're gonna put this into the holder. Most of you guys are familiar with this type of holder because of some aluminum dent repair kits have this piece in there and you notice that this is sitting right on top of the copper jacket. If we try and weld this on, the way that this is, this will not work properly because the shoulder is touching the top of the copper jacket. So what we're going to do is take this little screw on the bottom and I'm gonna bump this thing out about a millimeter above the copper jacket. And what that little difference is gonna do, even though electricity is flowing through both these pieces, that is going to force the electricity to go through the center point of the stud rather than jump off the shoulder of it attached to the copper jacket. So on this little screw on the back, it does have a little nut on it that we can just snug this up. So every time I go to put in this same size stud, I'm still going to have that little one millimeter space in it. So now that I have this loaded in properly, I'm going to take the gun assembly and then all these are the same base that go into the gun, and this is basically just going to go in and bottom this out, and this, if you push hard enough, this it does have a spring inside of it. All I want to do is push this copper jacket all the way in, and then take this nut, which does not come off the gun, this is a compression nut, and then I'm just going to snug this up, not really tight, just so that when I go to take this off of the panel, the copper piece does not come out. So once I have this piece on, we do have a couple of different size nose cones. They get progressively longer, and these are based on the size diameter of the stud. So the, the four millimeter, five millimeter, and six millimeter will use this cone, and the way that we can make sure that we have the correct cone on here is by putting this on, if we look across the nose cone, you should be able to see this stick out approximately two millimeters. And that is on the chart, that is called projection. We're gonna be going over that. But initially we have to make sure that the stud is set in the stud holder the correct way so that when we put the nose cone on, that the, uh, the projection is out. And what that part is going to do, remember I showed you this is spring loaded. When we go to weld this onto the panel, we are going to put some pressure back on that spring as we push the gun assembly down onto the panel and then push it all the way down solid. And what that is going to do when we pull the trigger, this is gonna lift up about a millimeter 
the electricity is going to arc through it to create the heat on the aluminum and melt the end of the stud and then the gun is going to release the spring and push it back down onto the panel. So before we go into setting that, we have a couple other settings on the list. One of them is going to be setting that lift of one millimeter. So we're at zero to zero on the calibration ring. So now I can turn around, look for my white mark on there and set it up to one. And the way that we set that is pull that out and we can turn this and set it at one millimeter. All this is is an electromagnet pulling back the pin on the inside and this is the depth setting of how far it can pull back. So I have my setting of one millimeter so that when I go fire the gun onto the panel, when I hit the trigger, the nozzle piece is gonna lift back one millimeter so that the electricity can arc through that and create the heat. My last setting on the back of the gun is on the back of this, this is called resilient setting. This is actually spring tension on the gun. So this is calling for number six on anything that we set up. So all I'm going to do is take my number six and make sure that it's over the white line. And this just rotates really simply. Be careful not to over rotate this. This is only designed for one complete revolution. If you force it past it, you just broke part of the springs on the inside. So all I'm going to do is turn number six so it's over the white line. And if I ever have to change my lift adjustment, this will rotate with it at the same time. So I really only have to set that one time. And basically when I pick the gun up, I look at zero to zero. Look at setting that one, look that the number six is still in place and we're good to go. All right, one of the last things we have to do on this on the chart shows reverse polarity. So what that means is that instead of the gun being power and the ground being ground, the electricity is actually going to go up through the ground clamps and the gun is actually going to become the ground. And the purpose for that is on reverse polarity of welding a stud into a panel as a replacement stud on the car, it's going to weld it in very, very solid. When we go to weld pull tabs to do a dent repair, that's a temporary welding on of a piece and we're going to use standard polarity on that and the electricity is not going to travel deeper into the panel. It'll almost look like a little drop of aluminum that the tab is sticking in. So to change reverse polarity on the machine, on this side there's a picture of the gun and this is to going to the gun assembly. This side is our two ground clamps and it shows a picture of the ground clamp. So if we just turn these, take them out just like a MIG welder, they are both the same. I'm going to take my gun assembly, put it into reverse polarity side, and I'm going to take my grounding clamps, which are now going to become transferring the power to the piece that we're welding on. So that is for all the studs that are on the sheet. The uh, aluminum pull bits for doing the dent repair, they don't have anything marked on it as being standard polarity. But it's one of those things, if you don't see reverse polarity on the sheet, do not change the clamps over. Make sure that you have standard polarity on that. So for studs, we are set up for reverse polarity, and we're going to go weld on a piece. All right, now we're going to put ground clamps on the panel that we're working on. So a couple things here. We do have two clamps. The reason why we have two clamps on this is because we want to make sure that we have a great path to ground when we shoot this stuff on. On the car, use a little bit of ingenuity on where to put these. If you're doing the middle part of a door, do not put one on each end of the door. Take the belt molding off the top of the door, put your ground clamps up there so they're out of the way. You wanna make sure that you are clamping directly to the panel that you're working on. So if you are working on a door, do not put the ground clamps on the rocker panel underneath. We wanna make sure that we have a close path to ground however it gets set up. So when we do put these on, where the wire does come into the clamp, this is one of the best places to put it because it's a direct connection to the jaw. If we put it on this way, all the ground is trying to go through this one pin that pivots that. So it's easier or better to put on this way. We want to make sure that the panel is clean. Uh, this is a uh, ICAR aluminum blank. It's a one millimeter piece of 4000 series. 
from sitting around, they do get rather oxidized, so I want to clean it really good with a stainless steel brush. I want to make sure that it gets cleaned first with some kind of solvent, usually either a good quality uh, 80 or 90% alcohol or acetone base on it that takes off any grease. Great idea to wear gloves as you're doing it so you don't get the oil from your hands transferred onto the product. Obviously, I am going to be doing that here. We are doing a sample on this for how this machine works. So cleanliness on the aluminum to aluminum is critical because basically aluminum melts at 1200 degrees. Oxidation on the panel or contamination in the panel does not start burning away until about 1500 degrees. So any dirt or contamination on an aluminum panel you cannot burn off like you can if you're MIG welding on steel, you can go right through paint. You can burn all that stuff away. On aluminum, if it's not clean, you're not going to have a good weld. It's going to be a failure of a weld. So when we go to take the stud assembly, that is also oxidized. So the easiest way of cleaning that without screwing up the little point on it is take a piece of Scotch-Brite and then just a little rotation back and forth to take off the oxidation. So when I go to put on... I want to be able to, uh, first of all, I want to make sure my gas is going to be coming through. This little connection right here can accidentally be hit, and this will bump up, and you think it's in, but it's not. So the best way of when you go to weld or right before you weld, I just want to pull the trigger, make sure I can hear gas flowing up here. I know I have a complete circuit going on. Now I want to take my pin and put it into where I cleaned. I don't care about the nose cone going around wherever that is, only the pin is going to get welded on. So I want to take my pin right over the top. We got that little two millimeter projection sticking out. I want to push the gun down so that the nose cone fits nice and snug. And now I can pull the trigger and hold it or pull the trigger and let it go. It's still going to go through the same cycle. So pull the trigger and then just pull straight up on it. So the stud is welded on, and the little four millimeters, there's virtually no heat in this right now. So the, per, the way that this thing works really so well is that taking the stud onto the panel, if we tried to force electricity through that stud to the panel, it would never slow down to create heat like steel does. So on this setup, when we pull the trigger, this pulls this up one millimeter, and this actually turns this into more of a spark plug where electricity is going to jump from the stud to the panel. That arc is going to create heat. It's going to heat up the base material of the panel. It's going to start melting the end of the stud and then the spring tension that's in the gun is going to shove it back down into the panel. And that all happens in five one thousandths of a second. So to make sure that I have good welding on this if i do this it seems like it's in pretty solid remember this is not a stud to take a dent out anymore this is a replacement stud in different sizes that i want to make sure that this is welded on solid so when i go to put on a muffler shield or a fender liner or a ground stud i want to make sure that it's not going to fall off in my hand as i go to tighten it so your best way of testing this is take a piece off of the car that you are replacing and use that piece as a test panel, weld on one of your studs and see how it tears off in comparison with the factory stud. So very simple test on this. I wanna see how strong this is. So if I do this and the actual stud breaks off and the base is solid into the panel, I have a good burn on it. So I know that my setting on that is going to be working well for what I do. The chart when we did our setup of the 400 amps and the 5 on the timer, that's a starting point for welding the stud on. And this is why we do a destructive test to see, number one, do we have compatible materials to weld to? Because I know that this piece of aluminum is a 4000 series. I know that this stud is a 4000 series. So when we talk about 4000 series and 5000 series, 4000 is aluminum silicium or aluminum silicone, and 5000 series is aluminum magnesium. So the big difference between magnesium and silicone 
is the temperature difference at what they melt at. So if we try to take a 5000 series pin and put it on a 4000 piece of aluminum, it looks like it will weld on, but the weld will break every time you go to do it. It's just like doing a, t a test weld on a spot welder. When you rock that piece back and forth, the, the weld in the center cannot separate. It has to tear away new metal. And that's exactly what we're doing with here. So if you find the situation where the stud is not welding on correctly, the best way of dealing with that is we don't increase power. The 400 is enough amps to blow a hole in this panel. We're going to take our timer of five one thousandths of a second and we're going to bump it up to 10 and try that and see how it holds. So to bump up from five to 10 or even 15 is not a lot of extra time on it, but it gives it that little bit more time to burn around completely in the circle to have a solid weld into the panel. So if we were having a problem with the, with the stud sticking in there or we didn't feel that it looked quite right, it had a little bit of a space in it that wasn't welded, we can come over to the menu board and again, we're not going to mess with the 400 on the amperage, on the power. All we're going to do is take our timer side and we're going to change from 5 up to 10. And now we're going to weld another stud on and see, and now... 10 might end up becoming too much that it actually overburns it, or it might give us that exact feeling that we're looking for on that so that we can fine tune our setting on a test piece before we actually go to working on the car. All right, so on the panel, I'm just gonna clean off another spot. I already have a, another stud in the gun, so I'm just going to clean this again. And by putting another replacement stud in there, I still have my one little one millimeter of gap in between the copper holder. So that's working well. I'm going to clean that. Onto the, I want to check gas flow. Go onto the panel. Pull straight up. Just a very, very tiny amount of warmth coming through this right now. Well, it looks actually a little bit more complete than what the other one had, and we'll do a little destruction on it. Broke off beautifully, but I can see on the base of it, we can notice that there's missing a little bit of a burn right around here. Even though it did break off, it really did pretty good. By bumping up the timer, this looks like it gave us a more complete burn all the way around the stud and everything is in on it. And by flipping the plate over, we can see if we can pick up on, I don't know if you can pick that up in the light, uh, how that's more of a full circle than that one there is. All right, so a couple of examples of the studs. The layout here is this is a, a generic four millimeter, five millimeter, six millimeter stud for holding on muffler shields, fender liners, wiring harnesses. This is an eight millimeter ground stud and this is a 10 millimeter ground stud. So with the different size holders and the different settings on the unit, you can end up welding these on. So I'm gonna show you a great example here. This is a ground stud off of an Audi R8. Rear frame rail section, very thin wall material. Took this piece off, took a little chisel, hammer, gave it a couple of taps, it broke off, and this was the actual tear out of the frame rail. Actually tore a hole inside the frame rail. So when we go to weld another stud on, I want to try and mimic the tear out that the factory stud had. So if I put a stud on with the settings on the chart, and this is my tear out on it. Again, I, it, it stuck really, really good. Put a chisel on it, knocked it off. My tear out is not quite the same. By adjusting the timer on it, this was the result that I ended up getting, where it actually tore a section of the frame rail out. So all we're trying to do is when we set time to do our test welding on this, is to be able to make sure that the studs that we put on are not gonna come off on the day of reassembly when the car is getting ready to leave and you, then you find out that they weren't welded on strong enough. So doing a destructive test is pretty well necessary on this 
you need to get some extra studs when you're working on the car and to be able to bill out your time properly for the time that it takes to do the destructive test.